Welcome to this tutorial where we review the 10 multiple choice questions from the 2020 Specialist Mathematics Tech Active Exam Paper 2 for the Queensland Certificate of Education. Let's dive straight into the first question. This question is asking about momentum. Momentum is given by mass times velocity. We're given information about the mass and position, so we need to determine an equation for the velocity. The rate of change of position will give us the velocity. In other words, we need to find when 7 times the derivative of the position function is equal to 620. So, the answer is option D. Question 2. This question involves Leslie matrices and requires us to compute a sequence of matrix multiplications starting from 2018 through to 2025, 7 in total. So it's much quicker to define the matrices and use the calculator. Notice also that the question asks for the total female population, that is the sum of what we might assume to be immature, fertile and mature members. Let's start with the Leslie matrix. Now we need to raise the Leslie matrix to the power of 7, then multiply it by the initial population matrix. We could add the values mentally and see the result is close to 4000. Alternatively, you could multiply by a column vector. So the answer is option B. Question 3. This question is about the normal distribution, where the probability is known and we need to determine one of the parameters. However, there is some important detail in the wording. We are told there is a 25% probability that the mean of 20 packets of cheese will be less than the labelled amount. This is very different than saying 25% of packets are underweight. For example, you might purchase 20 packets of cheese, 19 of them may be just over 500 grams and one might be significantly under, meaning that the sample mean is less than 500 grams. The mean of a sampling distribution is assumed to be the same as the population, but the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, referred to as a standard error, is equal to the standard deviation over the square root of n. We can use the inverse normal distribution. I'll use the standard normal. The probability or area is 0 0.25, the mean is 0, and the standard deviation is 1. Now we know the required z-score. We can use solve for the mean. And we get a mean of 501.1, which is option C. Before we move on to the next question, let's take a moment to understand this result. The red graph shows the normal distribution with a mean of 500 and a standard deviation of 7.37. The blue dots are a random sample of 20 blocks of cheese taken from this distribution. 
and the blue line shows the mean of this sample. I'll generate a couple of samples. Notice that approximately half of these samples have a mean less than 500. Our problem states that only 25% of samples have a mean less than 500. So, I'll increase the population mean to 501. Now when I generate samples, we notice that the mean doesn't fall below 500 grams as often. In fact, approximately 25% of our sample means are now below 500. If I increase the population mean to 504, hardly any of our sample means are below 500. Oh, and one last point. The sample size of 20. I'll shift the population mean back to 501 and up the sample size to 80, four times the original sample size. As our sample size is larger, the sample mean deviates less and less from the population mean. In other words, the larger sample provides a better estimate of the population mean, so we see less deviation. This is why the sample size is important in our question. Okay, question four. This question asks us to find the minimum speed of a particle. We are given information about its position versus time. I'll define the position function as d of t. The derivative of position time gives us velocity. We can find the maximum velocity by further differentiation. In other words, solve the second derivative equal to zero. This will give us the maximum or minimum velocity. Once you have the time or times, substitute them back into the velocity equation to check for the maximum speed. And we arrive at 2.07 meters per second. So the answer is option A. Of course, there are other ways to solve this problem. We could have just graphed the velocity function and then found the maximum. This is actually a more direct approach as it yields a velocity rather than working out the time and then substituting. This question is also a lovely example of how by hand calculations may be quicker. Differentiating our position function yields 1.32 pi over 2 times sine of pi t on 2. That's our velocity equation. We know that the maximum value of sine pi t over 2 is 1. As we're not concerned about when the maximum speed occurs, our answer for the maximum speed is simply 1.32 pi over 2, which of course is still equal to option A. Question 5. There are two distinct noteworthy items here. The first one is the equation expressed as y squared equals. The second item we are given is a gradient rather than a point. So we could use implicit differentiation. However, in this example, the equation is quite easy to transpose. When the equation is transposed, be aware that we should generally consider the positive and negative square root. Whilst the negative square root doesn't form part of this solution, it may be relevant in other cases. Another option for this problem is to graph the relation. Then draw a tangent. Once you've drawn the tangent, display the coordinates of the point where the tangent touches the curve. Then move the tangent until the gradient is approximately 1.36. And so we find the answer is option C. Question 6. The first thing to realise in this question is the x does not represent multiplication. x is a matrix. This question can be solved very quickly using algebra. 
but can also be solved using inverse matrices. I'll enter the three known matrices A, B, and C. We can start by multiplying both sides of the equation by the inverse of matrix A. Then C. Then inverse of matrix B. Now we have matrix X. So the answer is option B. Question 7. This is an example where by hand calculations will most likely be quicker. However, we can solve the problem on the calculator using trial and error. We use a Z interval since we know the sample mean, standard deviation, and sample size. We can determine a confidence interval. I'll start in the middle as a 90% confidence interval. That way I can go up or down accordingly. For a 90% confidence interval, we see that the population mean is not included. So we need to cast a wider net. A 95% confidence interval is the first of our options that includes a population mean. So the answer is option C. Question 8. This is a simple problem to solve on the calculator. Perhaps a clue that we should head towards a calculator is the power of 5. For by hand calculations, you would be better expressed in polar form. Whilst this is a relatively easy conversion in this case, it's not necessary on the calculator. We can store the values in U and V. Now simply enter the expression. Obviously the answer is negative 17, which is option A. Question 9. It is possible to solve this problem using matrices as vectors, but the approach is somewhat convoluted. The simple approach is to consider the equations for the I component first. We know that the I components must be the same when the objects collide, so we can simply graph the two I components. We can see that the I components are the same when T equals 0 and T equals 3. We also need the J and K components to be the same as each other respectively at the same time. We can see by inspection that this will not occur when T equals 0. So our only option is T equals 3. There are no options here that say the objects do not collide. Therefore, we must assume that one of the items, or one of the times, is correct. So t equals 3 must be the answer, which is option D. Of course, we can check the answer by substituting t equals 3 into the j and k components. Question 10. 
This is a straightforward question with or without the calculator. A 95% confidence interval aligns to two standard deviations from the mean. The calculator can calculate Z intervals. Note that we use the mean from our sample. We're creating a 95% confidence interval for the population mean. So the answer is option A. That's all for this session. We have covered the answers, some calculator techniques, and some important exam tips when it comes to answering multiple choice questions. There are many more free tutorials, revision sheets, and worksheets on the Texas Instruments Australia website. So, good luck for your next exam, and thanks for watching.